When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can seem intense. Like breakup R and B intense. I thought you said you love a sweater that I got you. If you did it, you could have told me. Geico makes it easy. Just go to Geico.com anytime to update or check your policy without all the extra drama. I even had a gift receipt. Blog Talk Radio. Are you looking for an all-natural solution to skincare? Try Simply see the all-natural skincare products. Coconut oil locks in moisture with nature's finest organic solution. Rich with vitamin E and rejuvenating proteins, it can help with enhancing skin nourishment for wrinkles, skin damage, tissue repair, and more. Simply Cita skin care line includes Simply Cita coconut oil, Simply Cita bath salts, and Simply Cita bath gel. Get healthier looking skin today. Order all three today for $40 at www.simplyceta.com. And I know for a fact that it helps with diabetic edema. My husband has edema on both of his legs. He is insulin dependent, and he also has very dry skin on his feet and toes, and it has made a world of difference. You definitely want to go to www.simplyceta.com and order her products today. They do not have any unnatural ingredients or any preservatives. It is all simply coconut oil with maybe a little jasmine. Order it today. Are you looking for a website creator that will make your website stand out above the herd? Are you looking for someone that knows your needs and can create a website that is not only eye-catching, but one that will stay with the customer as they scroll through the net? If so, contact Wellhaven and Associates. Lourdes Wellhaven has the magic touch when it comes to websites. You give her an idea and let her run with it, and she will create something beautiful. If you don't believe me, check out author Yvonne Mason at dot com and see what she has done for me. And here's the great thing. If you contact her and give her my name, she'll give you $100 off. So don't wait. Don't delay. Call today or go online and look up Will Haven and Associates and send her an email and tell her what you need. She will get back with you promptly. The year, 1888. The place, London's East End. Dead and mutilated bodies are popping up all over, from Stamford to Whitechapel. Jack the Ripper is leaving his mark, and the city's on edge. Yvonne Mason is back with a tale of murder and millinery. The Rhodes Hat Factory is booming while the body count rises. Why now? How are these hats connected? Has the Hatter gone mad? Mad Hatter, Yvonne Mason. Available now on Amazon.com. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Yvonne Mason, and once again, this is Off the Chain. Tonight, my guest is author Tim Ahrens, and he is a fantasy author. He has ha- has one book that he published in 2010, and he's working on another one, which we will discuss both of those tonight. But I just want to give you a little bit of insight into Tim. I've known Tim for quite a while. I've seen his journey. I've followed him on his journey, and hopefully I've helped him on his journey, along with a ho- whole multitude of other folks. But I'm just going to read his biography straight off of his web page. The question is, so who is Tim Ahrens anyway? Well, let's just go find out. When Tim Ahrens tells a story, he writes in a way that allows the reader to intimately experience the characters' lives and their adventures in the story. For Tim, this is the most enjoyable aspect of writing, that and, of course, the reader's enjoyment of his creations. Tim grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and he's always enjoyed a good story, comics, book, comic books, games, and movies. Often he enjoyed these diversions as a way of escaping difficulties in his own life. In his early years, he would watch Beast Sword and Sorcery movies and found that his imagination was really really inspired by them. 
Tim remembers one occasion as a young teenager having just seen a movie with two very good friends, and after the movie, they critiqued the film. Even at this young age, he's being a movie critic. Tim had explained to his friends that he would change the details of the film and corrected the plot in some areas to make it a better movie. Then one of the friends invited Tim to write a short story with him, sharing a pastime he would continue to work on and develop for more than 30 years and one that would also foster his creativity. Tim apparently agreed because in 2010, Tim released his first book, Tangela, and I probably just massacred it. That being said, I want to welcome my friend, Tim Ahrens. Welcome, Tim. Thank you very much, Yvonne. I very much appreciate you in the interview and you having taken your time to, to talk with me. Well, you know, we've been down this journey for many years now. Going on seven years we've been down this journey. I think we I started out in 2006 and you started out shortly thereafter. <laughs> Let, let's go back in time just a little bit. Tell me about that movie night. Oh, um, it was one of those B sword and sorcery movies. I was um, going out with a couple of friends of mine. Um, one was his name. One was Tim Atkinson. The other one, the other's name was Jason Yap. And uh, we have been watching this um, B, B movie at um, a theater that's no longer. Um, built anymore since one of those older theaters are gone now. And on the way home, we just started talking about the um, the plot line and 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 what the writers and the and the people were trying to do in the movie and what they missed in the movie. And in which case, um, one of my friends um, popped up and said, "Well, you know, you think you can do all this? You should probably write it all down." <laughs> so then I kind of agreed and I said, "Okay, well." And they kind of pushed me to to write my first short stories. What what were the first short stories that you wrote? Um, well, I wrote them all by hand, I, and uh, which case one was called the Demon, the Dragon, and the Diamond, which I might have to go go back and re redo one of these days. It's it's not in really good shape though, because it's written at such a young age. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what? then there were a couple others that I worked on that never saw the light of day, or I, I actually probably didn't end up finishing. Um, these two friends of mine, along with several others, were a member um, of um, a bunch of people we got together every weekend and played Dungeons and Dragons with. Believe it or not, yeah, I used to play that. <laughs> a lot of people did. And um, I was mainly the dungeon master, so that's, that actually helped me develop um, storytelling skills, um, as it were, at the time, too. Um, but there's a, there, are a lot, there are a lot of people out there encouraging me to do it, and so I started writing short stories. And then I ran into a good friend, uh, two good friends of mine. Um, one's name was Neil Reby, and, and um, the other one was Brad Besky. And when I started talking to them, they actually encouraged me to actually get something I was writing down published. And I was never really confident, very confident that that what I write, what I wrote at that time, even in short story form, would be publishable. But um, especially Neil Reby, he actually pointed out, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, my stories are as good as anybody else's out there. So um, he actually helped me get my first two short stories published, um, and one of which I co-wrote with him, which was Winter Ease, and um, the other one was To Die Well. I do believe I co-wrote that with him too. When I say co-wrote a short story, I mean I wrote part of it and he wrote part of it. Right. Um, after that, um, a friend of mine I've had a lot. I've had a lot of lucky breaks in my life when it comes to this. Um, a friend of mine just decided that she was going to try to open up her own editing and publishing business um, because she was an English major and and she she was also versed in several other languages. Um, and to which case, um, I talked to her about what type of business she was trying to get into. Um, and we worked out a situation where um, the salvation of Tang Legal could actually come come about, and it took me about another six or seven months to put that book together. And what I did was I pulled some of the short stories I had written before, and then I added new ones, and then I had to take all those short stories and, and then find a central theme in them all and wrap them all together in, into one, story, one solid novel. Well, since, since you brought up that book, it... Let's let's talk about that book for a minute. You and I were talking briefly before the show, and this book is good 
for young adults and, and preteens and teens to read, is it not? Oh, definitely. In fact, I sold one book to a friend of mine at work who read it to her 12-year-old son actually more than once because he actually really loved the, the stories in it. Explain how the the... I can't remember the main character's name because I read the book, Ladies and Gentlemen, when it first came out, and when you get my age, your brain doesn't retain things much anymore because I don't know why. But (laughs) explain your book to the audience and, and how the character moves through the different short stories to get to her destination. Okay, well, I can easily say that um, by pointing out that I had the great pleasure of getting Pierce Anthony to actually write my foreword for me for this book. And anyone who's read fantasy would know what, what, a, um, what a great honor it is to, to, to talk to Mr. Anthony, actually get him to write the foreword for it. Um, he actually called it a visual novel or a novel of several stories wrapped in together in a larger story that brings you into um, the educa- educate you in life. So the main character, which is Tyra, is actually a, a descendant of a, of a character you learn about later on in the book. Uh, she has no idea what her, her past uh, descendant has done or will do or, or might do. And Hunter is there to teach her what she's capable of because he knew what her ancestor was capable of. But he also knew that she didn't have the time to, say, um, learn life's lessons as everyone else does because uh, time was short in her case before calamity struck. So what he did was he used what he called a teaching stone. And when the person who holds the teaching stone looks within the gem, it allows you to experience the lives of other individuals at other times and other places. And then when you pull away from the gem, you can take that information that you've learned from them with you into your own mind, and thus it becomes your experiences along with theirs. So that's how he's teaching her to survive, or or he's going to teach her how to survive what is coming within the book. Um, So the book is is contained, contained within the book is about 13 short stories. And then I have three prologues. The prologues are there to help you understand how the book is being pulled together and how Tyra is learning from the stone and about herself as well as about everything else that she's being taught by the stone. And Hunter is there as more of a guardian or a teacher to make sure that she goes in the, in the, the direction that he hopes that she'll go in, instead of in the wrong direction, which can also take place. So, yeah, each story has a bit of a moral. Um, I always believed, um, ever since I saw this in a Mel Brooks film, believe it or not, (laughs) who was a very wise man, um, he once said that if you have an audience and you're trying to teach them something and they know you're trying to teach them something, you've lost lost that audience. But if you can tell a story in such a way that they'll be taught something without knowing that they're being taught something, then you've got an audience that will pay attention. (laughs) <laughs> so this is what would be a good, this is what would be a good book for preteens and teens is it teaches life lessons without them really knowing that they're learning those life lessons. Right, it allows them to interpret the lessons as they come along and and um apply it to their own experience in in a way that would benefit them most. The same way and, that Tara did as she was looking into the stone and and moving through the different levels of her life. That's correct, yep. <laughs> I didn't forget as much as I thought I did. Oh, no, no. In fact, you gave me a beautiful review on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, I have that review, come to think of it, if I can find it. Hold on just a second. Let me see. Because I remember when I read the book, I couldn't put it down. I just It just stayed with me and stayed with me. And like I said, that's, that's not my type of book, because you know what I write and read. Mm-hmm. But I could not put this book down. This is... Ladies and gentlemen, this is my review of this particular book. I am not usually a reader of fantasy. However, when I was asked to read The Salvation of Tangela for author Tim Ahrens, I decided to give it a go. I must say that reading this book was a complete and utter joy. Mr. Ahrens took several standalone short stories and wove them into a wonderful novel of fantasy and suspense. 
He writes in both first person and third person, which as an author is very difficult to do successfully. He weaves the story in such a way that the reader wants to know how all of these short stories melt together. Tangela is a society that has lost its way and its memories, and with that it has also lost its true purpose. All of the history has been destroyed and forgotten through apathy or greed and corruption. All that remains is a city full of citizens who have no souls. But one person is determined to renew the life and vitality of this city in the past. He seeks the one who will make that happen. This book is written in such a way that I would recommend it for young teens as well as adults. It is suspenseful, thrilling, and well-written. In many ways, Mr. Ahrens has defined our society of today. He has written the story in such a way that shows what happens when people lose their way through greed and corruption and the refusal to learn from the past. Ladies and gentlemen, I gave this book a a five-star rating. I would have given it more if Amazon would have let me give it more (laughs) because this book has so many life's lessons. And much like our society today, through greed and corruption, we have lost our way. So, Tim, don't you agree that maybe some of our politicians could take this book and read it and learn from it? I, I do agree that, that in some cases um, that there are people out there who could probably um, gain from reading the book, <laughs> be, be them politicians or otherwise. <laughs> Well, your attention to detail, because you know the old adage, if we do not learn from our past, we are destined to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And that is the same definition of stupidity. You know, keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different, no, that's insanity, and expect a different result, which sometimes stupidity and insanity do go hand in hand. Well, when I started writing originally, um, I know, as I mentioned before, I've read quite a bit of Pierce Anthony. I've also... um, Read Ray Bradbury quite a bit. Um, I read Huckleberry Finn, um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and and while you're reading this, a lot of these great authors, you learn that in some cases, when you're writing detail, less is better. That so if is you can true. give, yeah, if you can give the reader an idea of what the scene is around them, enough so, enough so they can picture it, but not so much detail that you fall asleep reading it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they'll fill in. Takes- when okay. it takes three paragraphs to describe a blade of grass, that's a little bit long. Yeah. <laughs> then the I have read some. Like yeah, so have I. Trust me. <laughs> you lose your reader readers. when that happens. Yeah. yeah, you lose your reader, and um, the and so when you when you don't do that, you, the reader will fill in all the pertinent details that you don't for themselves. That's true. And they'll. They'll actually make that that story more their own than they would have had you tried to force your own situation upon them. At least I've always found it that way anyway. <laughs> well, I think you told me earlier that you tried to draw the reader into the book. Definitely. I try to draw them into the actual character's mindset and or emotional emotional feel. So if the, for instance, in what big sisters do, you have a situation where someone is contemplating ending their life with a with a gun. When you enter that particular story, um, you should have a mindset and the uh, the emotional feel of the character at the moment of what he's doing, so that everything else in the story that follows is as much of a shock to you as it is to him. Otherwise, um, you lose. You, you you lose a lot of poignant poignant um, points within the story to do that. So what I try to do is I try to get the reader not only mentally but emotionally involved involved with the characters that they're reading about, so that they can apply it to themselves. And this would segue into something else that else that is in your bio, and that is that you are a huge fan of older style film. No, oh, yes, <laughs> from the fifties to the seventies. And explain why. Oh, God. Uh, in, it, it, no, this is pretty much all I can say is it's pretty much my opinion, um, as I said. So um, do I hope I don't offend anybody else about that. I mean, modern-day movies are great. They, 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 they do a good job. But in my opinion, if you watch a Weathering Heights so or you watch one of the universal old universal films, Tyrone Power films, um, even some of the 70s films out there, they didn't have the special effects abilities or the CG art to fall back on when their stories 
what they were writing about had huge holes in them. So if you're watching a, a movie and there's a huge hole, in a lot of cases, in my opinion, today movie um, producers or, or writers tend to fall back on CG to cover all that up. You know, if you have a big hole in getting from A to B, well, we'll just throw a big, huge action CG film scene in here, and that'll get us to where we're going. Uh, whereas in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, they didn't have those abilities. They had, um, surely, certainly they had special effects, but they, um, they had um, stop-motion photography like Ray Harryhausen and, stuff, and such like. Um, but they didn't have a way to cover those holes so neatly. So you really had to have a tight script in a lot of cases when you were going to do a film. And in some cases, they only gave you, especially for TV shows like Outer Limits or Twilight Zone, they only gave you six days to get that film done and in the can, um, and you still wanted to keep your, the people watching the, the, sh- the movie or the film or the TV show you were watching, so writers really had to be on top and tight with their storylines. This is why I like all the older films a lot better than I like a lot of the newer ones, is because um, as you watch an older film, you know, black and white or color, depending on what you prefer, um, in my opinion, a lot of those plot lines and characters are, are just ground, rock-solid tight. You know who they are, you know what their motivations are, you know where they're going, what they will do, what they won't do, and they don't step out of that boundary. Um, whereas in a lot of newer films, I, I've found that they're not so sure where their characters are, and they're a little wishy-washy in this way and that way, and then in which case um, then the movie ends up being, well, what is that? <laughs> And, and in the older films, if you notice, if if you watch the actor's face, they can say an entire sentence without opening their mouth. Oh, definitely. I can t- t- 100% agree. Um, some of the great ones um, were uh, Lawrence Olivier. He was great. Um, there's Tyrone Power. There's um, John Wayne. He was always great with that. Um, uh, oh, there's just, uh, there's just so many I can't even <laughs> keep up with them. <laughs> One of my favorites was the Lawrence Olivier, uh, Olivia de Havilland, um, the 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 female actress that played with John Wayne a lot, the Irish female actress. My mind is oh yes, Marie O'Hara. Yes, if you watch her and her movies with John Wayne, she just absolutely steals the scene. Yeah, they clip together well, don't they? They do. They do. They just blend because she steals the scene just with her look. And every yeah, time see, I think then, of her, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, see, back then I, have, I think that they, that the, a lot of the actors in uh, that I've heard about back in that days came from theater into movies. Yes. So they didn't actually go to a school to learn how to method act or anything. Like that. They actually learned on the stage. So that's where, in my opinion, where a lot of the um, emotion and stuff in their their eyes or the way they they use their their face or something like comes from in, in in those movies is the fact that they were theater trained first. A lot of them came out of vaudeville. Mhm, that's true too. James they, Cagney did. Yep, and they they had to project to an, a live audience on stage. So, yeah, if you're gonna steal a scene, you're gonna steal it with with a look or a a twitch of your hand or something to to Mm -hmm. grab the audience up on the stage with you. And this is what you do in your book. Yes, I try to make all of my characters upstage one another so that you just can't decide who the main character is or who you like better. (laughs) That is true. I could never decide. I would root for Tara for a while, and then I would root because I could feel Hunter's exasperation with Tara as they travel this journey, and he's trying to tell her, you're the one. Stop being so dumb. Get with the program. <laughs> um, I got a great compliment. Him. Oh, go ahead. She's fighting him the whole way. I got a great compliment when someone read um, the prototype to that to one of the stories in there called Choices, which is written from three different perspectives, um, which most people tell, well, most well, I shouldn't say most people. I should probably say I've read in books from most people's opinion that you shouldn't write from any more than one perspective. And I really, really dislike that. I, I feel if, if, you can, if you want to write from three different perspectives and still make it work and, and still tell the story beautifully, then go ahead and write it from three different perspectives. You don't have Absolutely. to necessarily write it from one perspective because um, you're leaving out some stuff. <laughs> well, and, and there is no right or wrong way to write anymore. 
Yeah, that did, used did to really speak? bother me when I was younger, um, is that, that they have these writing camps out there. And there's nothing against writing camps either. People have their own way of writing and, and their own style, and that's cool. And then there are people who learn from these camps, so don't, I'm not really bashing that either. But I am saying that people need to learn their own style and, and learn that if they want to write in a particular way, then there shouldn't be, a, a, a in my opinion, there shouldn't be a, a group of people out there that say, you can't write in that way. <laughs> that that I agree with you because when I was in school, more years than I want to think about, the the teachers in in that time period would not let me write my stories until I wrote an outline, and I thought, well, this is kind of stupid because if I'm giving you an outline, I've already written the story. Yeah, that's my why problem. Do I have to, why do I have to do it twice? Just let me write the story. If I need to flesh it out, I'll flesh it out. I'm not a dumbass. I know how to write. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my big problem is by writing an outline, by the time I'm done with the outline, the story in my head is finished, and now I have to start another one. <laughs> yeah, and you're going, why did I bother? Yeah. <laughs> to me, that's what my first draft is. That's my outline. <laughs> no, so I agree. I, need I agree 100%. Dumb outline. <laughs> yeah. And and you you do like I do, and I love you for it. You write in first and third person. Yeah, I love to change things up that way because um, it gets the reader a different perspective, a different way of looking at things. Like um, and when I first started writing in that that particular style. Um, I kept thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm telling the story from a third-person point of view, which is good, but then, you're, then there are people out there who are going to miss the reason why character B is doing what he's doing because you're only looking at it from the perspective of character A, which is in third person. Right. But if I, but if I turn character B into first person, well, now you understand what character A is doing from his third-person point of view, and you have a really good understanding of what character B is doing from his first-person point of view. <laughs> And and you're the you you're there with the more than one perspective within the story. Yeah, so that's what gives you a whole sorts of different points of view as the way you, the different ways you can look at the situations as they roll out. Um, it's it's beautifully um, it's a beautiful way to write if you can if you can handle it. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Well, before I ask you this, I have to do a little bit of of advertising here, ladies okay. and gentlemen. This is off the chain, and my name is Yvonne Mason. My guest tonight is Tim Ahrens, and he has written a beautiful, beautiful story called the, I'm going to let you pronounce it because my mind just went blank, Tim. The it's Salvation, the salvation of Tang Legal. Tang Legal. <laughs> See, I can't there even pronounce go. it. And it's, it's nothing <laughs> against you. It's after 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I go brain stupid. <laughs> I know that about me. <laughs> but this is off the chain, ladies and gentlemen, and you never know what's going to happen. But I want to ask you something, Tim. Um, on your bio, it, it says why I write and what I write. Tell me what you write and why you write it. Well, um, I mainly write fantasy, although I do tend to write um, dark fantasy, a gothic horror. Um, sometimes I'll write a science fiction piece, although it's more science fantasy than science fiction because I'm not what you would call a hard science fiction writer, as there several of my other friends would, would be. <laughs> um, in other words, um, instead of doing intensive studying to get the science fiction feel down, I tend to um, let it you know kind of fly in the wind and, and hope it sounds more like science fiction than it does a fantasy story. <laughs> Um, and I, I write all that stuff simply because I enjoy it. I enjoy the look on people's faces if they enjoy it. Um, I enjoy hearing what they think the characters are actually thinking about doing because um, although I know who the characters are and what, the, what their original motivations are, I love to see other, hear other people's takes on, on what this character meant or what this character was doing or how great this guy was or how terrible this individual was. <laughs> I understand and that. It, and and it just gives me immense amounts of joy to hear people talk about that sort of thing. Um, and so I write it um, more for other people than I do myself, although I do enjoy writing and getting into the heads of the characters and moving the story along. My pure fun of everything is to let other people read my work and then ask either ask me questions about what did this mean or, or turn around and go, you know, I'm, I, this, this character is just great because of this and because of that and because of this. <laughs> so do you find that people that read your work – get the same perspective out of it in the way that 
your perspective was, or do they generally form a completely different perspective that you didn't even think about? Well, most people end up with the same perspective I do at the end of the story, but while they're reading it, um, I've got a thousand different perspectives from a thousand different people as to why this this story ended up the way it did. Um, um, everyone agrees with my ending as to why they, well, the story ended with these people coming to this conclusion or doing this particular action, but they have a hundred different paths as to why they got there. <laughs> And it's it's like an an accident thing. If you see a a train wreck and you have ten witnesses, you're going to get ten different ten different stories. Yep. <laughs> because because people see things differently, which makes books such a wonderful tool for oh. the masses. Oh, definitely. In fact, if anyone ever wanted to get into writing, one of the few first persons I suggest they read besides Pierce Anthony uh, would be Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Any Sherlock Holmes oh, yes. novel? Yes. That is a beautiful example of writing something right up front and yet not being able to see it until the end of the story. <laughs> and it comes out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. It's really beautifully written. And you you don't understand why he's doing what he's doing until you have that aha moment at the end of the story because he he doesn't take you from point A to point B as a straight line. You've got all these little subplots and and subliminal messages in there, and you wonder what this crazy man's doing. (laughs) And the best part about um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's um, writing is the fact that, unlike a lot of other people, he doesn't leave any clues out. No, he doesn't. All the clues in his story are right there in front of you. You just don't see it. (laughs) Because they're so subliminal. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I always recommend him. Oh, I love. It. I've I've read Sherlock Holmes and watched Sherlock Holmes for years, but I do have to say, the new one that's out, the television series, mm-hmm. it can't hold. It cannot hold a candle to the original series from years ago that went strictly by the Sherlock Holmes books. Yeah, and I'm I'm finding I'm finding lately um a, a a new trend in in the writing business of a lot of people who are taking um stories from the past and they're trying to update them. Now, there's nothing bad about updating a story, but instead of updating and staying true to the original story, they decide they want to put their own little twists and turns in it because they don't think that a lot of people have seen the story or would remember it or anything like and they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I was doing an interview the other night with Armand Rosamilia. I don't know if you listened to that interview, but we talked about being careful who you get to edit your work. And, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bring this up again. While we're talking about this redoing of things, editors are a wonderful tool. We as writers need them. We have to have them because when we write, we see things that we think are there that really aren't there. But you have to have an editor that you trust because there are some editors out there that say they're editors when they really are what I call a frustrated writer. They want to write, but they don't have enough self-confidence to write, so they will take your work and rework it into what they think it should sound like. So for any of you that are getting ready to start out as writers, be very, very careful. Ask around. um, When you go to pick an editor, ask around and... See if that editor has done work that is um, credible because you don't want to turn your hard work over to someone else to redo. And like I said, we all need editors. It is imperative because I can tell you I leave dangling participles out all the time. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, my book wouldn't be anywhere near what it is without Lucid Style Author Services or Gene and Eric Terman. Um and the best part about what they did for the book was they didn't impede the stories. If she didn't understand something, she came right out and told me exactly what she didn't understand and what she thought I should do, what she thought I needed to expound upon so that it was more understandable. And that makes perfect sense. That's what a good editor would do. I'm, I've got a girl that is working on my latest true crime, and she's not a true crime reader, and I write true crime different than anybody in the world. And she would call me up and she'd say, Vaughn, I don't understand this explain it to me and then when I explain it to her she says well would it sound better this way 
And nine times out of ten, I agree with her because I've been mm-hmm. in the weeds with it for eight, nine, ten months, and I've read it six times, and it made sense to me all six times. But as long as that editor is is true to being an editor, and that to edit means to go over and to correct, not rewrite. If they're going to rewrite, that makes them a writer. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Um, Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. I do totally agree with that. Um, I was in a writer's group at one point, um, in which case um, there were several people who were paying um, editors to edit their work for them, um, even though they weren't going to publish it right away. And all these people were doing were were going through, and um, they were doing the best to edit their spelling and their punctuations, but they were doing nothing for their writing. Um, they weren't telling them that, you know, this section sounds a little strange. What do you mean by it? Or your characters, I don't understand who your character is. Can you be a little bit more, you know, flesh flush them out a little bit more or something like that? So, yeah, you could pay these pay people all the money you want to to edit, but make sure, I, I agree with you, but make sure you get a good editor. <laughs> yes. Someone, excuse me, someone that knows the difference between T O and T O O. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm very bad about screwing those two up, <laughs> and I, I'm really bad about transposing letters. So yes, but but in any book, ladies and gentlemen, in any book, I don't care if it's published by the big six and it's been through a thousand editors. Any book that is out there will never be perfectly written and i mean in not a not perfectly written as in perfectly written story or a good story i'm talking about in the editing because as humans we all make mistakes and they don't all get caught so if you're going to review a book don't review the book on the editing of the book that's kind of foolish because i've i even from the big even from the the authors that i read that are published by the big six, I find mistakes. Oh, yes. I, I would thing. I would definitely agree that, in fact, I always ask people who do want proofread my my work um, to read, please read it for content. Do not read it for um, typos or anything. Just read it for content and tell me what you think of the content. <laughs> exactly, because the other is like beating a dead horse. You... We all make mistakes. That is the nature of the beast. In fact, I was reading, I think it was a um, a book by um, Burke, James Lee Burke, and I read the sentence, and then I read the sentence again, and then I read the sentence a third time thinking, what am I missing here? Well, there was a mistake, but that did not delineate from the book itself and from the the content of the story. It was just a mistake. It happened. Get over mm-hmm. it. Yeah, now, you shouldn't be too hard on a good editor. Exactly. And you shouldn't be too hard on a good author. <laughs> I agree with that, too. <laughs> Let's talk about think, your philosophy on life I and tend, living. Yeah, I tend to think that the hardest people on authors are the authors themselves. <laughs> that is true. Oh, that is so true. That is I know a, more. I, I know more writers that beat themselves up over something they've done that that, that that they've written that I thought was really quite good, but no, and it was never good enough. It's not good enough. <laughs> well, see, this is what happened. This is another thing that I, I preach to up and coming writers. When you finish that book, let it go. Don't sit there and redo it and redo it and redo it and redo it because it's it's like anything else. The more you mess with it, the worse it gets. And you cannot keep you can't keep going back and fooling with it because if you do you just screw it up. Yeah, you you tend to you tend to lose focus of what you originally were intending when you wrote the book if you keep back going back there to rewrite it all the time. That I definitely agree exactly. with. Exactly. So, let's talk about your philosophy on life and living. Um, actually, I just think you should enjoy life as much as you possibly can. I mean, there are situations um, that come up that, that are going to throw roadblocks in your way and, and slow you down, stuff like that. But my philosophy has always been to, to just try to, to take one step at a time when it comes to those points and, and climb over the wall slowly, and you get over the other side, you'll be a lot happier. <laughs> and you also say um, don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't, because it, there's a lot of, lot of stuff that people 
including myself, um, have dwelled on in the past that make a small matter this huge, monstrous beast. <laughs> well, when you think about it, it's all small stuff. Yeah. Because none so of I us get to, out I, of love. So I tend to, I totally tend to, to, to just try to take things easy, as easy as possible. I mean, as I said, there are some things that you need to take a little more seriously than others, but, I mean, there are most most things in itself... If it's not life threatening to me, um I try to I, I try to take a step back and maybe take a step to the side and walk around and look at it three different ways. <laughs> and don't panic. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, I try not to make it this into this big indestructible monster that I can't move around or get past because it's not rectified. Well, it's not gonna rectify itself right away anyway, so <laughs> Well, if you can't change it, no point worrying about it anyway. That's true. <laughs> and if you can change it, you change it and be done with it and move on. Let's talk for a minute about your new book. Ah. Yes, my new book is called The Seven Pillars of Heaven. Um, it's a pretty, rather ambitious project, which is why it's taken me so long to, to, to get it done. Um, and And because... I work full time, and and other life's indiscretions happen to come up and tap you on the shoulder when you least expect it. <laughs> it that takes is a little true. while to get this that sort of thing taken care of. But this one is actually coming at it, whereas Tang Legal came at it from a central theme of one person learning from several others. This um, story is actually from seven different perspectives. Um, it's from seven completely separate individuals in completely separate places in the world, all being pulled together for one big moment in time in, in order to achieve a big something big in, that I can't really give away. Aha! <laughs> uh-huh. Boy, you are a party pooper. <laughs> Telling but, uh, you yeah, what. You, each person is separate. Um, there's two sisters um, right now. I can give you that. There's um, Zamin and and uh, Ming. <laughs> there's Zamin and and uh, oh, oh god, I got it. Forgotten the name. <laughs> you like me? You Ming Lu's in. Ming, Ming Lu's in. And then there's um. Oh uh, uh, yeah, I got a ton of uh, oh goodness, my brain's all shot shut down. I'm getting this bad as you are, Eva. <laughs> That happens on off the chain. <laughs> there are three. Uh, those are the three Asian major, uh, major characters, and there are several others outside of the Asian um, um, countries. Um, there's one from, I suppose you could, you would call it a, a standard fantasy individual, and then there's some demi humans that get involved. Demi humans being um, elves, dragons, um, such like, and so forth. All right, let's let's talk about your your fantasy um, books for a minute. How do you, for someone that wants to go into that genre and try to write a fantasy book, how do you build your cities and your towns and your countryside and your characters if something isn't real? But you see, that's the that's the whole point, though. If you're if if you train yourself, um, as you well know, writing crime fiction, if you train yourself or or, or find your own um, style of writing, then while you're writing your novel, it is real. Because what you have done before you started this novel, or while you're writing it, is you're building this all in your head as it goes along. So um, when you, when people ask me, for instance, how I build how I built Tang Legal and how I came up with Hunter and Tyra and, and Widowmaker and all those other characters, that's because they were alive at the moment I was writing the story. Um, I could see, I knew exactly what they looked like. I could describe them by as if, as if I was looking across the hallway at them. I know what their voices sound like. I know how what their personalities were like. Um, how do I create all that? They just they 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 build themselves into the character as the character moves. How did uh, you get really the hard... name? Tang... How did you get the name Tangla Gale? Um, and believe it or not, that one I just came up with off the cuff. <laughs> In most cases, I come up with character names and or places by looking at ordinary objects around me. Like um, the one I wrote with Neil Reby, uh, my short story, um, To Die Well, um, I came up with the main character, Rayla. 
while Raylo was, was based off of Rayovac battery because of the Rayovac battery on the, on the counters. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And her last name was Durrell. Well, that's back when I smoked, and I always smoked Durrells. <laughs> See, ladies and gentlemen, you if you want to be a writer, all you have to do is just turn your mind loose and let it do what it wants to do because the characters are there. Because I don't write fantasy, I don't understand how they come up with it because my world is rather real. My sister, on the other hand, would have understood it. How do you... Is sci-fi the same way that that Um, the characters talk to you or do you have to go out and try to figure out how to make a particular sci-fi story believable? Oh, um, no, no. I don't actually have to figure out how to make a, a, a fantasy or sci-fi story believable because everything is relative. Um, it's like crime. It, it's just, this is the kind of hard part for well, for me to explain, so I'm, if I confuse everyone, please tell me I'm confusing everyone. <laughs> no, go ahead. So everything Inquiring is relative. Minds so, know. <laughs> so if you're writing a crime story about Jack the Ripper, okay, for instance, in... Um, Mad Hatter, for instance. I saw heard you advertise at the beginning of the show. Right. Now, you take that character and you put him into a fantasy setting. Well, he's still as deranged killer as he was back in the 18, in 1888, except he's in a different <laughs> setting. So he's got the same personality. He's got the same motivations. He's just got a different profession. So you, cha- you decide, well, is he an assassin? Is he a thief? Is he a fighter? Um, what type of his profession? Well, if his profession was like that, then his build would be more... Say if he's a fighter, his build would be more stocky and less thin and, and agile. If he's an assassin, then he would be taller and thinner and less less muscularly built. Um, and then you start putting in the fun stuff, like the um, the, the facial expressions. Um, does he look like um, does, he, does he look like a rat? Is his face is his nose long and his chin slightly pointy? Is is does he look like a an average everyday individual who's nice and smiles and charming? <laughs> Um, and then you build in the ticks in the character um, that everyone has. Everyone has little ticks. Like when they're thinking, uh, for instance, a lot of people will do this because it's very noticeable to other people. They're thinking they'll take their finger and they'll rub it across their eyebrow. Or they'll take their hand and they'll put it under their chin. Or they'll rub their finger across their mouth or something like that. And, and you put in those little ticks, and people will all associate that with, with that immediately. Oh, yeah, I know what he's doing. Oh, yeah, I can see what he's doing. <laughs> Good point. Now, how would you put... Let's... Let's do this for our audience because we've got plenty of time. I want you, if you if you can, off the cuff. Now, we, okay. we, ladies and gentlemen, we have not prepared for this. This is just something that the, one of the voices in my head said, Yvonne, put him to this test just because the voice said it, I'm going to do it because it won't shut up. <laughs> let's, build, let's build a story since we're talking about the Ripper. Let's take him out of my Mad Hatter book. And let's put him into a sci-fi setting. Okay. Um, let's see. I write, actually, could you, do you mind if we put him in a fantasy setting instead of a sci-fi setting? That's fine, because fantasy okay. is your first genre. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Want somebody like the Ripper? Okay. So we're going to make him five foot seven because he'd have to be short enough... Um, to be agile enough, and a taller individual would be noticeable, more noticeable than a shorter individual would be. Um, I'm going to make him thin and wiry because I want him to be able to be more acrobatic and less um, powerhoused. Um, he's the Ripper, and he likes to torture women, but he's got to hide himself. So what we're going to do is we're going to give him a profession of an aristocrat. An aristocrat can get away with a lot more than just a regular individual can. And we're also going to put him in a town or a city. I think we'll go with a city. Um, A city that has um, two different layers to it. The first layer is um, above board. Um, It's like London. It's like everyday London. It's above board. It's great. Um, You have cathedrals. Um, You have huts and and small villages, and, and you have town squares and such. And then you have the poor part of town, um, the copper roads, the iron works, the leather makers. This is where he would hunt his prey. 
he has his prey because the A knows that the city guards and the city patrols aren't going to be hunting in that area very much because they don't really care about those people. They only care about the people with the money. <laughs> and he can get his right. <laughs> yeah. And he can get his work done a lot faster because he knows that anyone who does notice him is going to run like hell and oh, excuse me, run like heck and um and not really you know, really say anything until they get out of reach. By that time, he's out of the way. So let's see. What do we call our killer? Let me look around here for a minute. Um, let's see. We will call him Razor. Yeah, Razor. We'll call him Anthony Razor. Anthony Razor is a 35-year-old individual, about five foot seven. He weighs about 110 to 120 pounds. He talks something like this when he's with his peers, because you have to make sure that you keep this style of speech and, and this way of thinking around people who are like yourself, because they have to understand that, that, that you are on their same level. But, of course, you know, then you have the riffraff, yes, the riffraff. Oh, and the riffraff brings out the monster within you, yes, it does. It makes that little man inside you go, we must see, we must do, we must feel, we must experience, yes. And my knives, oh, they look glistening in the night, don't they? And then you put blood upon them and they look glistening even better. And then there's always the cute little women who denied you when you were younger. Oh, they denied you, but they'll deny you no more. <laughs> that is just keep beautiful. Going. Now, what would you call this fantasy town? Oh, jeez. Um, let's see. Is a city name? Um, Indigo Prefect is a good is a good start. Indigo Prefecture. Indigo Prefecture. I like mm-hmm. that. Now. Of course, you have to have a secondary character that it runs parallel to your protagonist. Mm-hmm. So how and in the ah, the Ripper this is the fun part though. This yeah, is the, the fun Ripper, part. The real Ripper had a a police captain that spent his entire life trying to find him, and of course he never did. And there so are rumors in, that he did find him actually. There are rumors, but they've never been proven yet. Right. Correct. So, <laughs> In, but this is a fantasy. So in mm-hmm. in this fantasy, your your My secondary character right. can either find him or not. So how would you describe the name, just like you did with with your Anthony Razor? Let's do the secondary character. Okay, well, this is the fun part because the secondary character would have to play off the main character, and you'd have to you'd have to be interested enough to follow the secondary character while the main character is doing evil stuff that might be interesting you more. <laughs> That's true. So the first thing I would do is is flip things up. Most people I've read in the past would make the secondary character like um, like his historic historically accurate would be a police lieutenant or a guard or something like that would run across these bodies and want to end this thing. Me, on the other hand, I would make it a female. I'd make his protagonist a female who's, who has learned the arts of mm, thievery, for instance, which is actually really a good, uh, a good play off of this. She's a thief. Um, how would I make her look? That all actually depends on, on the way the character acts, because I've got about 45 to 50 anime figures around me that I can pull out different descriptions of characters all over the place here. <laughs> Because I'm a big anime fan. <laughs> okay, so pick, blend some together for us. Okay, so let's see. We'll make her, see, I think so. If we've got Mr. Razor's going to have dark hair, either brown or black hair, we're going to make her a redhead because that makes her fiery. Um, she's a thief, so we're still going to keep her short, about 5'1", so she's hard to notice. Um, we're going to make her athletically built. And we're going to give her green eyes because that tends to show A with it shows up A with red hair and it also shows intelligence, um, at least in a character when you look at them. Um, we'll make her wiry, um, and we'll also make her the only individual who knows who he is. <laughs> All right. She also understands that if she goes to the city guard, she goes to anyone else, no one's going to believe her because she's a peasant, she's a thief, and she's a criminal. To which case they'd be more than happy to lock her up rather than believe her in locking an aristocrat up. 
So now this little woman, say I'll make her, who was even funnier, I'll make her between 16 and 18. She now has to figure out how to stop this individual without getting caught by the guards. Um, stopping him may, may mean getting him caught. It may mean killing him outright. It may mean turning people against him and or setting him up to, for a fall. But all this has to be done without the guards' notice, without, without any of the aristocrats getting wind of it because they'll shut everything down and, and he'll be protected. So she'll have to rely on her friends. Um, so now we have, we have to create some friends that she'll run into to, for help. <laughs> and the world just keeps growing from there. <laughs> uh, what, and what would you name her? Ah, let's see. We'll call her Vanessa Salt. A nice play on the last name because she had many <laughs> See, I picked right up on that. <laughs> Now, would this be set in a London Whitechapel type setting, or would it be set in a a setting of steampunk era London Whitechapel? Where would you set this? Okay, well, these characters could be set in several different possibilities depending on how deep and which direction you want to take the story. But if I were just doing a straight fantasy story, I would take a... Um, a medieval village, a medieval town or village um, like London in the 1700s or 1600s, with the castles and the and the brick buildings and such like and so forth. And then I would also, being at fantasy, I can do all this stuff. I I would mix in a little um, tannery in action from Viking eras and um, armor from different nations and such as it's a port city. Um, uh, the the air itself would not be clean. It would be choked with um, coal and stuff because that's what they burned back then was coal. So it would be choked and cho- uh, if, if it wasn't thick, it'd be it would be musty everywhere. Um, the streets would be rather dirty because they only wa- they waited for rainwater to clean those off. <laughs> that's true. Uh, um, the city would be bustling because once again it's a port city. Um, in the poorer sections of town, it would be quieter. A because the riff, more of the riffraff and gang members of, of that area and the, and the bullies would be around that area. But more because Mr. Razor has been in the area and now people are afraid. <laughs> would she have any um, qualities that would enable her to? Catch her prey. In other words, if she felt threatened, would she be able to physically get out of it, or would she have to rely on knife or, or gun or garrote or any of the things like that to get her out of her predicament? Well, being who she is, she would already have at least one or two escape routes in mind in case her plan fell through. But if those plans, if those escape routes were blocked, or if he uh, if he cut her off against those escape route escape routes, um, then she would have to rely on her ingenuity, um, her ability to use her knife. Since um, if she's a thief, she couldn't carry anything too heavy or large. She'd have to be a small, mobile knife that she could use at close quarters. Like a stiletto. And, yes, like a stiletto. Um, although a little bit bigger, more like a dagger. And uh, she would have to rely on her speed. So it would come down to the fact that if he's got her cornered, then she would have to use her fighting skills and intellect in order to get out of the way without getting killed um, and or talk him into a circle in or into a situation where she might have a chance to escape. If he hasn't cornered her, then she would have to use her athleticism to run <laughs> and then try to would outrun him. She, would she have maybe an undercover friend in the... And the guards, someone that maybe she had saved from some dire circumstance down the road, and he owed her. Well, if you want to add to in, add the guard, I I try to stay out of um, undercover situations as far as fantasy goes, unless of course it um, it plays into the story. In this particular story, um, an undercover situation would sound kind of to me would sound kind of contrived. So if I wanted the second individual in the guards, I would bring them closer to her instead of further away. I would make her make them uh, a relative, a brother, a cousin, somebody who had gone into the guards in order to escape their their way of life, for instance. Um, that way she could actually have 100% trust in this individual and talk to them, and, and they would be, like, blood-related. That makes sense. 
but would would let's just say for the sake of this fantasy discussion would they would would the guard not know they were related because maybe he didn't want them to know who she was that he well, might have he, to arrest her sometime or something. Well, you see, I can hide. He can hide his identity through paperwork. That's easy enough. This is where the fun of of writing this kind of these two kind of characters come in because you can put humor in this situation. <laughs> that is true. And I've always that found that true. if if you're writing a serious story, whether it be fantasy, science fiction, gothic horror, um, humor is is a great catalyst for um, livening the lightening the mood ever so much ever every once in a while because you really do have to lighten the mood occasionally. <laughs> Yeah, because if you don't, you get so bogged down in it, it makes you depressed when you're through reading. You want to go out and hang yourself or something, yeah. Yeah, I can yeah. name a couple of names of, of books like that, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah one, one of the biggest letdowns that I read years ago was Rosemary's Baby, because when I got to the end, I, I went, what? Really? Mm-mm. Yeah, really? I'm... I'm- I'm 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 not as well established as you, so I'm going to refrain from naming off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sat there and read through the whole thing. I'm thinking, good always overcomes evil, but really? <laughs> yeah. Really? And and so then I would, the other um, one. Okay. The other one that really blew my mind was um, uh, what's her name with the green pea soup and her spin in her head. Green the pea exorcist. soup. Oh, the, the Exorcist. Ex- oh. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking the movie. You know, she threw up in his green pea soup. You would have had to seen the movie because Actually, I'm watching I did. after. Well, after I read the book first, and then I'm watching the movie, and I'm going, really, <laughs> this is pitiful. <laughs> That's an, that was another one of those things where the special effects over over did the the storyline. Mm. But anyway, now that now that we've discussed this. This fantasy book, I think you should take it and run with it and write it. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. As soon as I'm done with my current short story, I'll consider it. <laughs> well, don't you think it would make an excellent twist on things? It would make a fun story. It would definitely make an excellent twist on things. And uh, and, and I will give it serious thought. I just want to finish Heart of Steel first before I start anything else. Otherwise, I'll never finish that oh, one. <laughs> yeah, we got it. We got to talk about hardest. Well, put that in your notes, and and because I don't write fantasy, I could not do it justice. But you, well, I'm glad could. you liked it. <laughs> I did. I, I told you the voices in my head wouldn't shut up, so we had to talk about it. And the voices <laughs> saying, "Dumbass, you know you can't write this, but Tim can, so give it to him." <laughs> Jeez, I wish these voices. <laughs> It's just a twist of perspective, in my opinion. Um, I can't write crime drama as well as you can because I'm not ne- as massively interested in crime drama as you are, um, which is why I think that some writers are really, really good in some subjects and have trouble in others. Is because it doesn't catch their interest, but they're trying to branch out. Um, if I were to try to branch out from fantasy, um, I wouldn't go into crime drama because I, I know I wouldn't be able to write worth a crud in crime drama. <laughs> crime drama. Well, you would take it too serious. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I probably would. <laughs> um, so if I were to branch out like something like that, I would try to go to gothic horror or something like that, which is completely different from crime drama. Well, well, that's a perspective, though. See. Well, that's true. Well, because see, when I say, go ahead. Gothic horror. Is like the old um, snuff book. And snuff oh books. no, the gothic horror is more like monsters, movie monsters, like vampires and werewolves and such like and so mm-hmm. forth. Like the old snuff films. <laughs> 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 okay. I did that with some horrible people in those snuff films. <laughs> yes, but you were. can take, you can take this, you know, the dreaded word outline that we just did, and mm-hmm. make a beautiful fascinating story. Oh, definitely. Wouldn't um, I could start one tonight actually if I wanted to. <laughs> See, there you go. But on that note, let's talk about Heart of Steel. Tell me what Heart of Steel is about. Okay. Well, Heart of Steel started out as just a short story. Um, it, the idea came to me because I read a book a long time ago, and, and I don't know who wrote it. I really wish I could remember. Maybe, uh, since you don't read fantasy, um, I know that you might not know it, but maybe one of the listeners out there do. I can't remember who wrote it. It's called Death Dealer. 
And there's a whole Death Dealer series out there um, on Fantasy Books. It was very, it's, it's an older series, um, but it's about a, an individual who puts on a set of cursed armor in order to protect his village and finds out that the armor is cursed so that he can't take it off. It turns him into this monster that's always working for the god of war, running around slaughtering things. <laughs> slaughtering people. Okay. So um, I got the idea that instead of using a, an arm, uh, a set of armor or a weapon, which is a lot of what other people would go for, um, what if um, I was writing a short story, what if I wrote a, a number of different short stories surrounding an item that made these weapons or an individual that inspired these, these weapons and or armor to be made? Then I can write a several, several different short stories around this particular circumstance and then at the end bring that central story right down into the center of it. So that's where that's Hearts of Steel came from. Um, it's um, It's got a very um, gothic Halloween type feel when it starts because I started thinking of France during the Hundred Year War um, when I started to write it, which is why it's got that kind of lonely, um, empty feeling of for the main character at the beginning. It, it also and makes you wonder who... Huh? Assume, in, I'm very interested in this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, it also makes you wonder who she is. Um, uh, there's another thing I, um, I personally do when I write uh, that a lot of other writers tell you, or a lot of other books, I should say, tell you not to do, that I break the cardinal rule to because I enjoy doing it, and most people who read my stuff enjoy that I do it. <laughs> I write flashbacks. There's a lot, of, a lot of stuff out there that I've read in books about how to write. Uh, they tell you don't write flashbacks. Stay away from flashbacks. Never touch a flashback. And I've always found that without a flashback at a certain particular point, you spend way too many chapters with a filler filling in the audience on what is going on compared to if I use just four or five pages of a flashback. <laughs> That's true. To, to tell you what happened. That way, I don't ever have to go back to the to the to the situation because it's already in the reader's the back of the reader's mind what this person's past is. Um, so anyway, um, so I, I I set her up that way to make people wonder who she is and give her an air of mystery, and then I had her walk into the town that she was supposed to go to, and meet uh, several other people to enhance that mystery. She meets a bard um, who seems to know her, but she doesn't seem to know. She meets the tavern people and the, and the other individuals in town. And um, all this is leading up towards someone that she's hunting, and there's some reason why she's there. Um, but all of this, all, of these, all the other stories I may uh, bring into this anthology will all spring from this one thing that created all of these other instances. And Sounds that's almost. something... And that's something it sounds I like. like the way they, sounds like the way they write Game of Thrones. Yeah, it is a little bit like that. Um, and all these things uh, all have become, are all made on something called the uh, Anvil of Sorrow. Mm. Now I'm not going to tell you what the Anvil of Sorrow is, but you can you can pretty much get your imagination run wild for that. <laughs> yeah, doesn't sound like a friendly anvil at all. Um, it's not meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> so Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Yvonne Mason, and this is Off the Chain. My guest tonight is Tim Ahrens, and we are discussing all things fantasy. He has a book out called Salvation of Tangela, and if you haven't read it yet, you need to get it as a birthday gift or a bar mitzvah gift or a Christmas gift or just because you want your child to read gifts because Tim told me earlier in the evening that... Um, a woman had bought this book and had read it to her 12-year-old child and had to read it to him how many times, Tim? She wrote it to him three times. <laughs> because he liked it so much. Yeah, he kept finding a, different things in the stories that he wanted to hear about. <laughs> and and every time you read it, of course, you see you hear and read something different. So get this book. It is a, it's very well done. It, it's, I can't explain to you. I don't like fantasy. But I like this book. I tend to live in the real world, so when I read fantasy, I'm going, eh, not so much. But this book, I could not put it down. I would fall asleep reading it because it is just such a good book. And I wanted to know what Tara and Hunter were doing and why Hunter couldn't keep Tara on track and why they fought like cats and dogs. 
and where they were going with all of this. Now, in the let me ask you this, Tim. In the book, we have the stone where she sees the past. If I remember correctly, and I might be wrong, but doesn't her um, ex- life experiences go into the stone for someone else for the next one? Um. Well, it's a teaching stone, so what um, Hunter is doing is he's picking and choosing people from the past and the present uh, to teach her different lessons that she needs to learn in order to survive. So the stone, what the stone does is, is it seeks out what is most pertinent for that individual in those circumstances to learn, and then it puts them within that person's mind. And it allows them to walk around in their skin as if they are that person, and it takes their life experience back with them. So if for some reason Hunter had decided that it was pertinent for another individual to to learn something of what Tara had done or would do in a certain situation or a, a skill that she had that no one else, anyone else could copy, yes, then he could actually use that stone to draw that out of, of the past or the present into someone else. See, ladies and gentlemen, you just... You just learn so much because that is that is what life lessons are about. We learn, or we should learn, from other people and take those experiences and put them into our lives so that our past sometimes isn't so bumpy. But just like Tara and Salvation of Tangela, she wanted to make her own mistakes. She wanted to fall on her own face. And she fought Hunter the entire way until one day she woke up and it dawned on her, hey, dummy, I'm doing this all wrong. I can't save my city if I'm not paying attention. Am I correct in that? You're very correct. (laughs) (laughs) Much like today where the definition of insanity is we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Let me ask you this. Um, well, tell I know the that audience. One, okay. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Oh, I know that one of the major questions I get about Tangla Gal in the, the book in my writing style is how I can write a, a, such strong female characters. And um, I take it from a, a quote from Josh Wheaton, who wrote um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the TV show, and he's, he's a very prolific writer when it comes to television and stuff. Is how can I not write a strong female character? <laughs> well, because um, for one thing, you're pretty comfortable in your own skin, so you don't mind writing a strong female character. No, I actually enjoy watching women walk around in my head and do these things. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're a very bad boy, Tim. That's the dark side of you that nobody knew. See how well I worked that one in? (laughs) But I know that a lot of people have trouble switching genders, and I never had a problem with that because, to me, people are all the same. Um, Personalities are, are, to me, pretty much universal. Um, uh, The gender just just changes the attitude that people look at that, that, that character to be. Um, so if I want to throw people off a track of something, I'll take a, a, a character that would traditionally be male, and I'll turn it over to female, or vice versa. Interesting. And that throws people Very. left and right. <laughs> yeah, that that would throw me, except I have done that in one of my books, and like you, I've had people call me and say, what were you thinking? <laughs> so, uh-huh. I don't know what to tell you. It's just what the character told me to do. Deal with it. What I would like for you to do, I, for one, did not know who Piers Anthony was. I've never read any of his work. Oh. But he, he's had an influence on you. Ex- explain to our listening audience who this author is. I know I'm going to have to read his work now simply because you've piqued my interest and I have to see what it's all about. So explain to me what he writes how he writes, and how he influenced you. Oh, Pierce Anthony is, is a well-established writer. Um, he, as I said, he was he was gracious enough to write me a um, an intro to my book. He's written all the Xanth series of novels. They're a fantasy series of novels of in other other dimensions. Um, so you with Xanth, you can go from a modern setting into a fantasy setting by walking through a doorway. <laughs> wow. 
Um, uh, he's he's written the Zant series. He's written the um, was it the uh, uh, oh yeah the eternal the eternal. Let me think here. Oh, the Immortal series. Yeah, he wrote the Immortal series. That is based off of um, immortal beings that have been known through time, like death or um, the weaver who weaves the skis of fate. Um, all those are great books. He's he's read uh, he's written the um, the Blue Adapt series, which is another great set of books um, that deals with science fiction and fantasy, both combined. Beautifully written. Um, along with all with several others, as I say, he's a very hugely prolific writer, um, and his work is still out there. Um, I know he doesn't get as much attention as he used to in the past, but I recommend people go out, and especially people who like fantasy, decent fantasy, with a great sense of humor, and beautifully told stories with very well-rounded characters. I recommend people go out there and read his stuff again and pick them up because they are just great, especially On a Pale Horse, which is one of my favorite books by him. <laughs> I've heard about that book, but I didn't know he wrote it. Yes, he wrote it. Uh, it's, it's the Immortal series. It's called. It's on uh, the Pale Horse. Is about death. Um, in in uh, okay, I think it's. Um, uh, I can't remember the complete title, but I think it's in the in the scheme of in the scheme of time. Um, this, this deals with the Weaver of Fates. Um, uh, he deals with the Norse goddess. A couple of uh, the three North Norse goddesses of fate. He deals, he deals with quite a few of um of uh, myths and legends. And he brings them into modern settings. <laughs> now I know I've got to read him just because you made him interesting. Like I said, because fantasy is not in my genre, and I did not know who this writer was, but I am open to reading him because he sounds like a fascinating storyteller. Oh, he's, he's great, and he doesn't bring his own personal perspective on religion or anything into the books themselves. Uh, or into his own books, he actually allows the reader to do with what they wish to do with you know with the characters of the book when it comes to that. I know I've read quite a few books in the past where where uh, some of the writers are trying to push their own beliefs on onto the reader as they as you read through the book. And Pierce wasn't like that at all. He actually um, he actually gives you um, opposite perspectives of 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 say for instance religion and whether people want to believe in religion or not or believe in death or not. Or and he's a beautiful beautiful writer when it comes to that. And, and back to perspective, the way that that you write, you allow that reader to also draw their own perspective. And in, in, we've talked about this before the show, that when readers read a book and they do the reviews, they want to say, well, I think the writer meant this. No, not necessarily. That's what your perspective is. You're, you, as a writer, might have had an entirely different perspective, and it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It's all wrong. No, no, I, yeah, yeah, no, I never take uh, the attitude that what I've written is, is should be perceived in stone as this is the way it should be perceived. Because if I were to take that attitude, people wouldn't enjoy my stories at all. <laughs> that is true. But on the flip side of that, readers should not be adamant that what they got out of that book was was different than what you wrote, and so therefore what you wrote wasn't a good book. It's all it's oh. all relative in in how they perceived the story within itself. Like we talked Correct. about earlier, you have ten people at a train wreck, you're going to get ten different perspectives. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Yeah, but it should all come to the same. They should all come to the same conclusion at the end of the story, though. Right. There's a bad guy, mm-hmm. good guy. Things happened the way they did. We might not always like the way it ended, but that was the story. Mm-hmm. I've had um, I've had a few people tell me that there are a couple of stories in, in Tangle Gale that um, they wish it ended differently. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, see, this, um, this, happens, this happens to me when I watch television. I can tell my husband, oh, this is not going to end well way before the ending yeah. and sure enough it doesn't end well but that's the story yeah that's my big problem when it comes to watching movies and such i've i've, I've gotten into plots i've been in doing plots and and storylines for so long that in a lot of cases i'll be watching something and i'll go i've seen this coming a million miles away i see it coming a million miles away <laughs> I know who the bad guy is. Yeah, why I'm going to keep my something? mouth shut. I know who did it. Mm. <laughs> but the, oh, 
but that's what aggravates me about modern day storytelling on film. It, it is so transparent. I bet Alfred Hitchcock is rolling over in his grave. Yeah, there's very there's, there's, it's a very big lack of subtlety in movies these days. <laughs> so um, obvious. A great example of that, of something that's, that, in my opinion, for movies, that's something for that Hitchcock did, that, that's placed something in front of you, and yet none of the characters in the screen but you, who are outside of the story, know about, is rope. Yes. Yeah. If you get a yep. chance, I recommend to the, to the listeners, anyone out there, watch Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, because it's beautifully done. And it's it's very subtle. It's very subtle, and it's. It, I love the way he does the camera work, where he moves into this particular object and he pulls away to that particular object. The 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 psycho scared me to death, but the you never rude. saw. Yeah, you never saw the it, murder. No, you didn't need to though. No, because and, it was so subtly done. <laughs> But um, unfortunately, with, with Hitchcock, and especially with Psycho, he was actually restricted from showing a lot. He, he actually wanted to show the murder. He wanted to show the grisly part of it. But the, um, uh, uh, what is it, um, the people who, who, who um, oh, shoot, I can't think of the, the, the movie people the who producers. won't let you do that stuff. Thank you. Yeah, the producers. <laughs> the censors. The censors wouldn't let him do that. Thank you. My brain died there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's catching. <laughs> but um, but, it, yes, would, but it, it wouldn't have been as effective if he had shown um, the blood and the gore. That's true. That's true. Um, I think at the moment he was when he was talking about that he wanted the shock value. Oh, it got the shock the... value from me because for years I wouldn't get in the shower. <laughs> Don't be shutting that shower curtain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd be pleased to hear that. <laughs> yeah. It scared me to death. Don't be shutting that shower curtain. I don't want somebody I can't see coming in here stabbing me with a knife. <laughs> so, yeah, I grew up on all of that stuff, which probably added to my imagination and stuff. I grew up with Alfred Hitchcock prevent, uh, Presents and The Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and all those old 50s and 60s black and whites and, and color shows. There's one out there called One Step Beyond that I grew up with. It was just fantastic about horror stories. <laughs> Well, and The Outer Limits, that's another one. You never saw it coming. No, they did, they only had six days to shoot those stories, and they shot them. And it was a 30-minute show. Mm-hmm. Yep, they shot it, they shot it beautifully done. And and sadly, the same thing in in, in horror books now. The, the yeah, a lot, horror, of them are, a lot of them just aren't what they should be. At well, least not as far as reader. Well, yes, yeah, the problem is is well, you know, there are there are some good horror writers out there and 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 stuff. Um, present company um included. You're a great horror writer. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, but I don't you, I don't overload the the reader's senses. That's the uh, that's the trend today, though. Everyone's jumping on the bag- bandwagon, um, so to speak. Uh, here's a good example. Um, I'm sure you've run into this a hundred times too from other writers, um, uh, especially newer ones. Um, not that I'm an experienced, massively experienced writer, but I, I have run into people who are just getting into the business. Uh, in which case, um, when, 50, when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, oh good God, um, I about a dozen, book. yeah, about a dozen people I know dropped whatever they were doing and started to write these erotic. Ironic books now because they sell. Well, that doesn't mean they're going to sell when you got it finished. <laughs> That's true, and it doesn't mean it's going to be good. Fifty Shades of Grey, and and I I don't know. I'm not normally critical of another author, but sadly, Fifty Shades of Grey is the epitome of bad writing. There's no plot. Yeah, There's no nothing. I can't say I've ever read the book. I just know the trend, and I saw the trend of everybody moving towards that style of book because she sold that book for so much money. And I always tell these people, well, no, no, don't go, go back to what you were writing. Write the stuff that you want to write um, because trying to copy somebody else's genre and break into it that way is not going to help you. Well, it makes you look foolish, too, because <laughs> it tells me that you have no imagination on your own. And, and the sad part, what what really irritates me is 
that it makes rape sound okay. Yeah. And it's not yeah, okay. It's, no, it's not. It's um, and it's not a very subtle me. book, <laughs> from what no, I've heard anyway. <laughs> I've read bits and pieces, and I'm going really, seriously. You're filling your mind with this junk that has nothing that is redeeming. Yeah, the Mad Hatter is 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 a horror historical fiction, but it has redeeming virtues within the story. It has life's lessons within the story. It's not just murder and mayhem and madness. There are life's lessons. The same yeah, thing with not- my true crime. They may be raw, but you're gonna you're gonna get a story out of it, a life mm-hmm. lesson out of it. Same thing in your fantasies. You may have some horrible things in your fantasies, but they're just not ramblings of over the top junk. Yeah, no, um, no. Your your books has have has nearly as much as much as much of a point as my books do, um, as far as that sort of thing goes. Um, in fact, I think that there are a lot of people out there who don't realize or remember a lot of these characters from history, and they shouldn't be reminded of them. Uh, for instance, especially exactly. the Ripper, especially the Ripper and and such like. Um, um, these things should not should not be forgotten. <laughs> no, because history keeps repeating itself over and over again. We have um, a little more than four minutes left, so I'm going to give you about three of those minutes to. Tell the listening audience your philosophy about fulfilling your dream and how they can do their fulfill their dream. Um, if you want to fulfill your dream, the best thing you can possibly do, I agree with a lot of other people who have said this before me too, don't give up on it. Never give up on, on, on a dream that's reachable. Um, if you want to be a writer, um, work at it. Um, you don't necessarily have to do it 24-7. You don't necessarily have to be a Stephen King. You don't necessarily have to be me or anybody else. Um, you should find your own niche and, and do what you enjoy. If you never get to the level of Stephen King, like I may never get to, the, to, to being selling books like Stephen King, um, but I have sold a few, um, that's fine, because I enjoy doing what I'm doing. I'm living my dream the way I wish to live it. Um, my dream isn't to make millions and millions of dollars by writing a book. My dream is to write a book that everyone will enjoy. Um, a lot of people want to be musicians. Their dream is to sing. Um, their dream isn't to make millions and millions of money, although it helps. <laughs> millions and millions of money to as a singer. Um, but their their dream is merely to sing. If your dream is to write, then write. Um if you look down and you think that it, it, it's not good enough, well, then start over with another story. Eventually, you'll find your flow. You'll find your writing style. Um, it just takes practice. Um, and I don't mean practice as in a work ethic of practice, practice, practice. <laughs> um, I mean that, that it, it, it just takes time to develop characters and situations in your mind and to learn how to to observe those situations in your mind without seeing the present day in front of you. If you're writing fantasy or science fiction or something like that, if you're writing um, uh, you know, gothic horror, then you just got to learn to set the mood and and to see what's going on around you as if you're looking at it. That's the hardest thing to lo- to do to train your imagination to do is to provide you with the scenes in front of you while you're writing. The only way you can do that is to, hmm? go ahead. Oh, go ahead. The only way you can do that is to work at it. My philosophy is this, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sure that Tim will agree with me, that to have never have tried, you have already failed. If you oh, yeah, try you... it and you find out that's not really what you thought it was, you succeeded. And you can always go out and find another dream. I mean, dreams are a, a dime a dozen. Um, uh, they're wonderful things to have. Never lose them. Um the people who are really, really sad and depressed and desperate in this world are the people who have no dreams. Um, they look at the world as being a gray, ugly, dreamless place where life is tedium and, and boring, and, and I don't look at life that way. <laughs> we, are, we are 90 seconds out, and this is Off the Chain. I am your host, Yvonne Mason. My guest tonight has been Tim Ahern. Please get his book, The Salvation of Tangela. Watch for Seven Pillars of Heaven and Heart of Steel. 
Hits up with Tim on Facebook. This show will be archived on Talk. It will also be archived on iTunes plus other podcast medias. Tim, I want to thank you again for being my guest and for allowing me to interview you. It is a privilege and an honor. And you know that I will support you any way that I can. And let's do this again. I would be pleased that I am very honored to have been asked on this show. Um, I appreciate your advertising of my book, and I always appreciate your friendship because it's always been worth 100% of gold. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. Ladies and gentlemen, we are down to the, the nitty-gritty. You're going to probably get me cut off here shortly. But I do want to say that we do appreciate our listening audience. I'm always looking for guests. You don't have to be an author. Anything is off the chain. Again, this is off the chain, and I am your Yvonne Mason. Until tomorrow night, good night. Tim, thank you so, so much, my friend, for coming on the show tonight. I appreciate the advertising. I appreciate your help. I've always appreciated you, Yvonne. (laughs) (laughs) And what I will do once I get these uploaded, I'll send you all the links. I will also send you the link to iTunes so that you can pass it around to your friends that use iTunes and let your friends know that it also goes to Stitcher. I'll send all that to you once I get all the different links, and then you can pass it out and put it on your um, on your website and on your Facebook page, and let's get Seven Pillars of Heaven out there and start promoting it. Thank you very much, Yvonne. I appreciate everything you've done for me in the past and the, in the future. And if you ever need anything, as I've said before, by all means, just call and ask. I'll be right there for you. Thank you, dear, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good day. Or all righty. <laughs> bye bye. <Bye-bye. laughs> Record better audio anywhere with Motive Digital Microphones from Shure. Easy-to-use options like the MV88 plug directly into your phone or computer and include a free app. Create studio-quality sound for podcasts, music, and videos. Visit Shure.com to learn more. I figured out who the neighbor around the corner is. Oh, yeah? I like him a lot. Ooh. He lets me talk as much as I want, is very simple, and has great plans. <laughs> okay, I have to meet him. Sure. Say hi. This is Metro PCS. Metro PCS is in your neighborhood. Come say hi and get unlimited data, talk, and text for only $30, period. All on the fast nationwide 4G LTE T Mobile network. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figure it out. Coverage not available in some areas. One gigabyte of high speed data included. See store for details, terms, and conditions, and data management info.